Reading People by Anne Bogle Book Summary A peek into the world of personality types. We live in an age of viral personality quizzes. Whether on BuzzFeed or Facebook, every day, millions of us click through questionnaires about everything from Harry Potter to our favorite foods. But how much do these tests really tell us about our personalities? Not much, it turns out. If you really want to find out who you are, you need to do more than check a couple of boxes in an online quiz. That's where Anne Bogle's study comes in. It provides a clear overview of the most important personality frameworks, such as Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram. As you'll see in these blinks, these approaches can yield fascinating, and life-changing, insights about every facet of life from relationships to spirituality and work. Along the way, you'll also find out what introverts and extroverts have in common, how to say I love you in five different languages, and why changing your behavior, not your personality, is key. Your personal struggles can shed light on your personality type. There's nothing easier than repressing an unpleasant thought or ignoring an awkward situation. Humans are so good at this that there are even cases where women only realized they were pregnant as they were giving birth. Ignoring truths, it seems, is a natural part of the human condition. No wonder, then, that we struggle to determine our personality types. Take personality tests. Oftentimes, we respond to questions about our character by talking about who we would like to be rather than honestly assessing who we actually are. This is something the author noticed herself when she sat a Myers-Briggs test, a self-assessment report that analyzes different personality types. The test results said that she was a so-called architect. In the Myers-Briggs schema, architects are highly analytical and critical perfectionists. Now, the author had always been something of a bookworm, so these traits seemed plausible enough, and she accepted the categorization. There was just one problem, this information wasn't helping her get a better handle on herself. Why was that? Simple, the test results were wrong. In the end, it was the author's conflicts with her husband that helped her shed light on who she really was. These conflicts always seemed to come down to the emotionally raw way in which she expressed herself during clashes. Because her husband, well, didn't respond in this manner, she assumed he didn't care, and this upset her even more. This was a clue. Maybe she wasn't an architect but an idealist, that is, someone who expresses themselves through emotions. Will, by contrast, was a rationalist, someone who is less emotional and more cerebral. Once the author realized this, she could see the issue more clearly. It wasn't that Will didn't care or wasn't listening, it was just that he had a different way of thinking about and dealing with conflict. And that just goes to show that struggles are often more illuminating than personality tests when it comes to understanding yourself. Introverts and extroverts have one thing in common, they need coping strategies to deal with life. As a child, the author was very shy. This was something her mother, who often tried to convince her to say hello when running into acquaintances at the supermarket, struggled to understand. But the simple reason was this, the author was an introvert, whereas her chatty mother was an extrovert. So what does that mean? Well, although the idea goes back to the psychologist Carl Jung's work in the 1920s, it was first popularized by Susan Cain's 2012 book Quiet and her TED Talks about the power of introverts. Today, we're beginning to understand that the differences between these two personality types come down to the way in which the brain is wired. Outgoing extroverts, for example, process information faster than reserved introverts. This is why they can react in real time and speak quickly. Put simply, information passes down a shorter pathway in the brains of extroverts than it does in those of introverts, who typically process the same information in multiple regions of the brain. That's not the only difference. Introverts are generally happier when the parasympathetic nervous system is activated. This is the part of the body's electrical wiring that is responsible for resting and digesting. For it to work effectively, it needs peace and quiet. 
Extroverts, by contrast, prefer it when their sympathetic nervous system is activated. This is responsible for fight or flight reactions, and it is triggered by stimulating environments. The upshot of these differences is that both introverts and extroverts need particular strategies to cope with life. Take an extrovert mother who decides to homeschool her kids. All that time spent cooped up at home without social interaction with her peers means she'll need to find a balance. This could be going for a walk with a friend or simply chatting to neighbors at the local supermarket. Similarly, an introvert at a noisy party will also need some balance if they're going to enjoy themselves. In this case, that might be an occasional breather in a quiet space. Sensitive types react strongly to sensory stimuli and need some peace and quiet. When her children were young, the author often spent her Thursday mornings alone with them. Looking around, she'd see littered surfaces, overexcited kids rushing around, and the family's barking dog. This was extremely stressful for the author, although she couldn't quite explain why. It was only later that she realized what was going on, she's a highly sensitive person or HSP for short. Highly sensitive people are often mixed up with introverts, but these labels describe different personality types. Introverts find excessive social interaction draining. HSPs, by contrast, suffer when they are overstimulated by their environments. Excessive noise, visual clutter, or smells are all types of stimuli that can overwhelm an HSP. This heightened sensitivity means that HSPs have an array of special needs. One of the easiest ways of preventing external stimuli from becoming overwhelming is to take regular breaks in environments that are completely free of sensory input. It's also important to pay attention to the environment in general. HSPs find it hard to ignore or cope with noises around them, which is why the sound of traffic on a busy road or someone whistling a monotonous tune can drive them crazy. Quiet spaces are, therefore, essential. But it's not just space itself that's important, it's what HSPs do in that space. If you're highly sensitive, your best bet is to retreat to a space in which you're shielded from the noise and then do nothing. Don't watch a movie or listen to a podcast, just give your brain a chance to relax. Take it from the author. She learned that the best way to avoid getting overwhelmed when she is alone with her kids is to take a short break or delegate tasks. Since she started doing that, she is much less prone to stress. There are five languages of love, understanding them helps relationships. For many years, regardless of the occasion, the author received greeting cards from her mother-in-law. She wasn't the only recipient of these small tokens of affection. Whether it was a small or large occasion, virtually everyone in her mother-in-law's address book got a card. The author, on the other hand, never wrote a single card in her life, until she discovered the five languages of love. This concept comes from a book by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. Let's take a look at these languages. The first is called words of affirmation. People who respond to this language understand love through compliments and appreciative statements. Choosing the right words is what makes the users of this language feel loved. Then there's quality time. Folks who use this language feel loved when you spend time alone with them and give them your undivided attention. The third is called getting and receiving gifts. People oriented toward this language are touched most by symbols of love, whether that's a wedding ring or a commemorative gift like the ticket from their first movie date with their partner. The fourth language is acts of service. People who speak it don't care about words. To feel loved, they need to see action, whether that's mowing the lawn or preparing a special dinner. Finally, there's physical touch. For the speakers of this language, loving touch, hugs, and kisses are the principal ways to communicate love. So how can this help your relationships? Well, say your partner speaks acts of service. For them, spending a whole weekend weeding and planting the garden as a surprise for you seems like a great idea. But imagine your language is quality time. 
chances are, you'd much rather spend time talking with your partner. In this situation, it's highly likely you'll end up speaking past one another and arguing. Understanding the love languages, however, can prevent these conflicts from arising. The Kearsey Temperament Sorter can help us adjust our expectations about other people. The author once ran into a problem with one of her children. As someone who is naturally spontaneous, she would often book last-minute holidays and trips. Her child, however, preferred planning ahead and wanted to know if anything out of the ordinary was happening months in advance. This had all the makings of a conflict until the author realized that she and her child simply had different temperaments. So what does this mean? Well, let's break it down by looking at a well-known personality assessment methodology developed in the 1960s by psychologist David Kearsey, the Kearsey Temperament Sorter. Kearsey believed that humanity was divided into four different kinds of people. First off, there are artisans. These are people who live in the present and are grounded in reality but also have a creative streak. Next up, guardians. These are the protectors of the status quo and traditions. Guardians are reliable, sensible, and completely focused on the present. The third group is made up of idealists, people with a vivid imagination and strong sense of intuition. If you're in this group, you tend to focus on what could be rather than what is. Finally, there are rationals. Like idealists, rationals look to the future but they do this in a purely logical manner. This makes them great problem solvers. Understanding these different personality types is a great way of adjusting our expectations of others and their behavior. Put simply, the Kearsey temperament sorta shows that other people are different and that that's okay. So, say your partner is a guardian. From the perspective of an excitement-loving idealist, guardians can seem pretty boring with their insistence that everything is planned out in advance. Kearsey's schema, however, helps us recognize that traits that might strike us as annoying also have positive corollaries. Meticulous planners, for example, are usually also dependable, trustworthy, and loyal, the very qualities that make them great partners. Once you understand this, it's much easier to be realistic and reasonable about your expectations. No person, after all, can be everything for you. The Myers-Briggs Type Indicator is based on four dichotomies, helping you to see your strengths and weaknesses. The gold standard in personality testing is the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. It was created more than a century ago by mother and daughter team Catherine Briggs and Isabel Briggs Myers. The schema they developed is based on four dichotomies. The first is between introversion and extroversion. Introverts prefer turning their attention inward toward the world of ideas and imagination. Extroverts, by contrast, prefer engaging with the outside world. Then there's the dichotomy of intuition and sensing. People who use their intuition focus on possibilities and the often unexpected connections between contrasting ideas. Those who rely on sensing understand the world by analyzing the data collected by their five senses. Next up, thinking versus feeling. When thinkers make decisions, they proceed logically and analytically. Feelers, on the other hand, follow their hearts when they make important calls. Finally, there's judging and perceiving. As the name suggests, judges are decision-oriented. Once they've made their judgment, they move on to the next issue. Perceivers take their time and like to make sure they have all the available information before making a decision. So what do these dichotomies allow us to do? Simple, they help us identify strengths and weaknesses. This is important for two reasons. First, knowing your strengths contributes to your sense of self-worth and tells you what you can contribute to relationships and projects. Knowing your weaknesses, meanwhile, is the first step to avoiding mistakes. Take an introverted, sensing, and feeling judger, ISFJ for short. This is a people person with strong core values who is friendly, responsible, and practical. 
ISFJs typically dislike change, can be overly preoccupied with appearances, and have a tendency to guilt people into doing things they don't want to do themselves. The Myers-Briggs type indicator tells us that this person will likely need a lot of positive affirmation and may neglect self-care in favor of helping others. The Enneagram details nine personality types and helps us understand behavioral patterns. Writing, as any author will tell you, is an arduous business, which is why very few authors enjoy the process itself. Once they've finished writing, however, they feel great. The same goes for the Enneagram, using the system is tough, but it's worth it in the end. The term Enneagram is derived from the Greek words for nine Enya and drawing grammar. And that's what it is, a sketch of nine personality types. This schema was popularized by the Armenian philosopher George Gurdjieff, though its exact origins remain unclear. Let's take a closer look at these nine types. First off, reformers, perfectionists who set very high standards of behavior. Next, helpers, people who love to support others and sometimes neglect their own needs. Then there are achievers, competitive types who can easily become obsessed with their goals. Individualists, meanwhile, tend to focus on what is missing in their lives. Investigators are intellectual and live a life of a mind. Then there are loyalists, people who value security and responsibility but can sometimes be overly cautious. Enthusiasts, by contrast, are hedonists who know how to enjoy life but often end up going too far. Challengers are power personalities who like to assert themselves. Finally, there are peacemakers, the guardians of harmony. This isn't just a theory, though, your Enneagram type can give you real insights into your personality. Take the author, a peacemaker. When she understood that this was her personality type, she saw that her desire to avoid conflict led her to prioritize others' needs over her own. Peacemakers often lose track of themselves in this way. When the author was a young mother, for example, she frequently ended up taking advice on raising kids that she didn't really believe was right. But now that she's more aware of her Enneagram, she can stop herself from taking on other people's opinions simply to avoid conflict. People can change a lot over time because behavior is flexible even if personality type is more stable. People who spend their entire lives in the same small town know that personalities tend to remain a constant down the years. The loud, boisterous teenager often becomes a loud, boisterous adult. But it isn't always this way, in fact, people can change a lot over time. Take it from the author. She once met one of her old high school classmates at a local farmer's market. Back then, this friend had been a troublemaker who rarely paid attention to teachers and who had been expelled time and again. At one point, she had even called all the boys in their class and pretended to be the author. Luckily, one of the boys saw through the ruse and blew her cover. Years later, this woman had changed beyond recognition. She had married a pediatrician, had a child and was getting up early to buy healthy organic food for her family. People clearly can change, but not everyone does. So what's going on here? Well, think of it this way. Personality types remain relatively constant throughout life. An introverted child will, in all likelihood, become an introverted adult. But that doesn't mean people's behavior can't change. Over time and with practice, an introvert can learn to have a social life that's every bit as fulfilling as that of an extrovert. The key, in other words, is your mindset. People with a growth mindset tend to believe that they can change and grow, and this helps them balance out more fragile or inconvenient aspects of their personalities. Folks with a fixed mindset, meanwhile, believe that they cannot change and tend to get stuck in unhelpful behavioral patterns. So remember, whatever you've learned about your personality, none of your characteristics are set in stone and they certainly shouldn't stop you from doing what you want to do. On the contrary, understanding your strengths and weaknesses will help you achieve what you dream of by making you aware of potential pitfalls along the way. Personalities are diverse and complex. 
Thankfully, there are numerous methods out there to help you understand your particular personality better. From rating yourself as an introvert or an extrovert to finding out your exact Myers-Briggs personality type, these methods can teach you how to take care of yourself and interact with others. Thank you for watching please don't forget to like and subscribe.